So my mom's the only one that's able to sit in this evening, but she still counts. So a few weeks ago, I was walking with my sister and my mom. Uh, my dog, Sunny, was pulling my arm out of its socket, as per usual. And uh, I was walking down the old Oxford Mill Road. Um, and it was just, you know, a normal day. The only thing that wasn't normal was that it was um, a weekday. Usually we take walks on the weekend together. Um, but that day was supposed to be a school day. Spring break had already ended. Um, however, the doors of schools across Kansas uh, and the U.S. were still closed. So that previous Sunday, we had already gotten a message from the school saying that um, it would be canceled that week. And then the situation would be reevaluated. So in my mind, it was like, oh great, I've got an extra week of spring break, and I just, you know, fully assumed that I would go back to school that next week uh, and finish out my senior year. So then, that day walking down the road, we got another text, and then a call. All our phones were ringing because the school, you know, has all our numbers, and so, you know, immediately we all got the, the message. And so I picked up the phone, and I heard the pre-recorded voice say that the school, uh, school for the remainder of the year had been canceled due to COVID-19. So I'm not a very emotional person most of the time. I don't react very strongly to things. Um, but in that moment, I was, I was truly shocked. I wasn't really sure how to process the fact that high school uh, was essentially over for me. And I had a lot of questions. Um, but at that point, it was mid to late March, I think I got that text or that call on like the 22nd or something. Um, but in that, during that time, things weren't really as serious. I mean, uh, in the way that it hadn't really affected our lives, really at all at that point. We had heard, you know, the news coverage about it and how it had affected other states, um, but everything was still open. Um, everyone was still going to work, uh, but like I said, in other states and, you know, other places in the world, um, cases were on the rise. And, you know, places like Italy and Spain and Germany were starting to suffer. Um, lockdowns are happening, things are closing up, and the next week Kansas followed suit. Um, actually that next Thursday my hairdresser called because I had an appointment that Friday um, and she told me that she could only get me in on that day because uh, that day at midnight uh, Sumner County was uh, going under lockdown. And then that next day, or that next week, sorry, Kansas um, did the same thing and, and called for a stay-at-home order. So up until then, I mean, we've been watching the news coverage about it and everything. Um, you know, we uh, reports uh, we had seen, you know, talking about it kind of cropping up in other states. And, you know, you sort of always feel like you're watching from afar. Um, there's kind of this peripheral thought that it won't affect you. You, su you assume that you'll just be kind of a spectator. But now, um, we're all kind of playing the game, so to speak. We're we all are under that same threat. So um, the following weeks after that, uh, we kind of, we were submerged into a whole new routine. Um, school, um, our school made arrangements for the year to be finished out virtually. We uh, went by the school in our car and you know, the teachers were on the, on the curb in masks and gloves and they handed us a packet full of our information and everything. And in the past few weeks have been, you know, full of Zoom meetings and emailing and you know, just finishing our, um, our tests and taking pictures of them and everything and sending them in that way. But in other aspects of our life that have changed, um, my dad works from home now. Uh, and my mom and I, you know, we venture out into public, and, you know, once a week with our masks on to go to the store. We wear a mask to um, go to my grandparents' house. They live across the street from us. And now we get their groceries, you know, because they're uh, extra vul vul vulnerable. Um, and I have, you know, a few cleaning jobs during the week and, you know, I glove up and mask up and, you know, I sanitize everything now. Um, but I would say probably one of the biggest aspects of our life that's changed is, uh, our worship routine. Um, because as a Jehovah's Witness, most of the time, um, you know, twice a week, we all meet together. You know, we have Bible discussions and, and you know, it's just nice to be with each other and everything. And, uh, and probably the biggest part of our worship is our ministry work. And um, we go out multiple times a week uh, into the communities and, you know, most people know us because we come to their door and, and we, you know, spread, spread the good news. But, you know, recently, um, you know, of course that can't be the case anymore. We've, we've had to cease our door-to-door -door ministry and now 
uh, we are trying to reach people through letters. So um, we are reaching out to as many people as we can, you know, people that we know, people in our neighborhood, and trying to get the message to them that way. But um, I know that our family is truly fortunate because my dad is still able to work. Um, he's in tech support, so I mean, he's been able to help a lot of companies that have, you know, had to set up uh, remote uh, uh, remote function. He's been able to help them do that, and uh, so we still have income. And I realize that a lot of other people are viewed as, you know, non-essential workers, so they don't have that anymore. And, and I, I, I don't, you know, know how that feels to, you know, not know where my next meal is coming from. Um, and also the fact that we do live in a rural community means that we are not as, you know, at risk as people in, you know, higher population areas. Like I said, you know, some are out of work, some are, are you know, they're holding out um, for these stimulus checks from the government. And the government doesn't even really know <laughs> what their next move is going to be. They're scrambling to come up with solutions and, and trying to prop up the, the collapsing economy, weighing out whether to, uh, you know, make the economy their priority or to focus on, you know, the health of the populations. Um, some people are, you know, they're isolated all alone. I mean, I'm with my family every day, um, you know, and so I, and I get to talk to my friends and everything on the phone and, but for some people, they, you know, they have very few contacts, they're alone, and they can't see their loved ones. Um, and, you know, some people, I mean, a lot of people, more now than ever, have the virus. Or maybe someone that they love does. Um, maybe they've even lost someone to it. So there's a lot of people that are, are much worse off, unfortunately. But I think at this point, the world has one central focus, and that's the future. Um, how will each you know place deal with this uh, and the repercussions that it's having um and like i talked about you know the government is is just kind of it's a toss-up between you know the greater good of of the economy and you know the people the the health and safety of the people so can things ever go back to normal after this i mean i, I don't see it that happening um what what will things look like after this it's really hard to imagine that all of these industries and, and the economy as a whole uh, being the same ever again just because this has been so debilitating to it. Um, it's possible that we might be dealing with, you know, observing these same precautions for some time, like wearing uh, masks in public and social distancing, all of that, for, you know, much longer than any of us had anticipated. Um, so, you know, in that way our public freedom could be restricted uh, until this threat is eradicated, essentially. And, um, even if things return to normal, you know, uh, sometime in the future, I think people would soon kind of forget the, the impact that it's had. Um, throughout the worst world tragedies down through history, people seem to kind of in that moment, you know, they band together, they want to be more united and, and fight the common enemy, whatever that is at the time. And we're kind of seeing this now. Um, people feel more connected than they ever have in, in ways that they never imagined. You know, they're, they're forced to be with each other, so, you know, they're getting closer together. They're reaching out to friends that they haven't talked to in years. And, you know, there's outreach programs to help those who, you know, are, are financially unstable. So, you know, we're seeing people come together and everything. And to the point of kindness versus safety, I think we're seeing both of those things. Um, like I said, you know, everyone is seems to be kind of uh, taking it, uh, um, looking after each other, being kind while at the same time, you know, being apart from each other. So there's a lot of people that are adhering to the rules that are that are given to them. Um, so, you know, they're being kind and they're being uh, respectful of safety regulations. But then there are other people that seem to completely disregard, you know, the rules that have been set out. Um, so, you know, we're seeing both. But, you know, personally, I think that, um, you know, safety and kindness are both really the top priority at this time until, you know, we see this this um, this problem solved um, but like I said even after this is eradicated um, you know and like I guess in the past when um, when those problems of you know whatever that is that you know whatever storm that they've been uh, weathering afterwards they seem to forget um, you know whatever new resolutions that they come up with or you know, whatever it is, they kind of seem to forget those. And, you know, the world returns to what it was. The problems continue and they pick up where they left off. Um, but my belief is that one day um, we'll never experience any kind of world catastrophe ever again because uh, matters will be taken out of, 
man's hands, who tried endlessly to solve problems that are just unsolvable um, in our, in our, uh, under our watch. You know, they'll ne never be able to um, solve these problems. I'd like to quote um, Jeremiah 10, 23. It's a scripture that really talks a lot to that point of man, you know, not really be able to solve the world's, you know, most um, prevalent problems. It's Jeremiah 10, 23. It says, I well know, O Jehovah, that man's way does not belong to him. It does not belong to man who is walking, even to direct his step. So, um... You know, we see there that we're not really created to handle, you know, these responsibilities. Because only God can um, end the suffering of the human family. And he promises to do that. And I hope that the future generations will be able to live in a world that's free from the things that are running so rampant. The problems that are running so rampant right now. And that means learning what they need to do to qualify um, to benefit from those promises. And if they do, then they'll enjoy those benefits eternally.